the leader in talk radio on the Internet, right here on K98talk.com. If you want to work until you keel over, have less of everything in retirement, or give back more of your hard-earned money to the stock market again, then just ignore me. But if you'd like to protect the money you save, receive a steady, predictable retirement income, and enjoy financial security for as long as you live, then listen to this. You can download a free report that reveals the wealth-building secrets Wall Street and the banks don't want you to know. You'll learn how you can get guaranteed growth, safety, and real prosperity without risking your money in the Wall Street casino and how to get the money you need when you need it simply by asking for it. This is the best way to have a 100% secure retirement and know your money will last as long as you do. To learn more about this method and to get your free report, go to 29security.com. That's the number 29security.com. 29security.com. Go to 29security.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable everyday carry or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-696-1030. Again, 800-696-1030. That's 800-696-1030. 800-696-1030. All right, folks, this is Rick Robinson with you. I want to tell you about some friends of mine from a company called Security Enforcement Specialists. When I ran my security agency for 12 years, I worked with one of these partners on a daily basis. He's been involved in this agency now, and with his other partner, they do have over 30 years of experience in the private security industry. If you own a business and you need someone to keep you or your customers or residents safe, then I highly recommend contacting Security Enforcement Specialists today. Give them a call at 405-703-1796. Again, that's 405-703-1796. Again, tell them Rick from K98 Talk sent you. Like I said, if you need the help, they are here for you. So make sure that you uh, go look them up, check them out, and see what they can do. The wrong way. Welcome to the place. J. 
Joe had huge problems with the IRS. I knew it was coming. I hadn't filed taxes since 1990. All the IRS letters coming in added up to a nightmare. It got up to like $68,000. My heart started beating fast. It's like, there's no way, man. I mean, I ain't going to be able to do this. Then they stopped his paycheck. So that's when I started making phone calls and found U.S. Tax Shield. U.S. Tax Shield went to work immediately. They just took the bull by the horns. What blew my mind is he called the IRS right then and there. So why is U.S. Tax Shield A-plus rated with the Better Business Bureau? Joe knows. They saved me a ridiculous amount of money. If you owe more than $10,000 to the IRS or state, choose the company Joe chose, U.S. Tax Shield. It was the best decision I made. U.S. Tax Shield is the way to go. Life is good. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Call 800-471-3287. U.S. Tax Shield. boo Yes. <laughs> 800-471-3287. 800-471-3287. The Internet will never be the same. You're listening to K98talk.com. Prepare yourself. Okay, let's go. From a studio deep in the heart of Texas. You're not going to believe the garbage that fell out of his mouth. The voice of the working man. This clown had the audacity to say that. It's the Gavin Mitchell Show. It's not a race issue. It's a First Amendment issue, and we all just need to understand it. And now, here's your host, Gavin Mitchell. Oftentimes, ladies and gentlemen, you will hear the left and, and quite frankly, most individuals in this world complain about problems but pose no solution. Today, we will pose a solution. Welcome to the Gavin Mitchell Show. I am Gavin Mitchell, and this country has run amok. We, we have a lawless tyrant leading this country who insists on attacking our constitutional rights and liberties, attacking our culture, our way of life with no regard to what we want, what we think is right, and has completely forgotten that this is a government for the people, by the people. It is the enforcer, the con man in chief, shoving his way of life down our throat at all costs. And we're ready to draw a line. And it's enough kicking and screaming, enough complaining, enough, oh, shame on him, poor me. It is time to take a stand, and that is what today's show is going to be about. What is the solution to this debacle that we now call the federal government? What do we do? What outlets do we have to push back against a tyrannical, lawless government? And there is one, folks. The answer is not marching in the streets of Baltimore or Chicago screaming Black Lives Matter. That is not the answer. This is a democracy, and it's a democracy based on intellectual debate and civil problem solving, and that is what we are are here to do. So with all of that said, the governor of the great state of Texas, Greg Abbott, came out last week, and my gosh, it is a bold move for a governor, but it is much needed, and hats off to the governor of the state of Texas. Abbott released well, at a conference here in Dallas a 72-page document talking about what the fixes are for this federal government overreach. They have overstepped their bounds. What is the answer? And when you shake it all out and you boil it down to what it really is, Governor Greg Abbott endorsed and called for the state legislature to vote through the House for Texas to sign the petition to convene a a conference of the states. Now, what does that mean? It is not a constitutional conference, right? That, that's not it. If, if we're having a constitutional conference, then we're in a world of mess. It is not a constitutional convention, as we know, happened in Philadelphia back when we were putting the country together. This is... This is a, well, what's the right terminology here? What this is, is this is a security net that was placed in the Constitution by the Founding Fathers for this very reason. It is a safety net so that if the federal government gets too strong, 
if it gains too much momentum, if it reaches too far outside its bounds, the states can get together and they can, through their House, Senate, and, and their House of Representatives, can pass movements for the state to participate in a convention of the states. It takes two-thirds of the states to agree to meet for a convention of the states. They get together and they come up with ratifications, changes, amendments to the Constitution. This is one of the two ways you amend or change the Constitution of the United States is a convention of states. The other route is that it has to go through Congress. We all know that's not going to happen because we have a tyrant sitting in the White House, his cronies working on Capitol Hill, and zero opposition party. There is no one up there outside Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, Pete Sessions, and maybe a handful of others that are willing to push back. Zero opportunity for it happening through going through Congress. So it has to be the states that initiate this. And I know this is a lot of information all at once, but I want you to understand what's going on before we get into what Governor Abbott said. So the states have to pass through their state legislature this this proclamation that they are going to participate. It takes two-thirds of the states or 34 states to say, we're going to have ourselves a little convention of the states. Once you get to this convention of states, motions are, are, are passed and, and elected and, and things of this nature, and they come out with resolutions. And these resolutions or so-called amendments proposed amendments, changes, whatever the case is, they then go back to the states where they have to be ratified. Now, unlike the two-thirds requirement to have the states get together, it takes three-quarters to ratify their proposed changes. And if three-quarters ratify their proposed changes, then the Constitution has been adjusted. Now, this seems incredibly extreme for what we have going on today, but what we have going on today is, is incredibly extreme. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and our founding fathers and the framers of the Constitution were wise enough. They were well-researched enough. They were able to look into the future with forward thinking and understanding from history what has happened previously to give the states this bailout, to give them this parachute and this ripcord that if a tyrant like Barack Obama lands in the White House and starts just executive ordering this and that, shoving socialism down your throat, and there is no opposition party in Congress to stop him, and the Supreme Court's in his back pocket rewriting his law so that it goes through and passes the Supreme Court's test, and the one and only test doesn't embark, impede, infringe on constitutional rights and liberties. This is why this is here. They are extreme measures for desperate situations. And so Governor Abbott comes out and says, you know what? Us here in Texas, we've had enough. We've had all we wanted this nonsense. We're sick of you going after our guns. We're sick of you babying the Muslim religion and persecuting the Christian religion in our schools, in our workplace. We're sick of transgendered individuals claiming discrimination when we don't do that in Texas. Men go in men's restrooms and women go in women's restrooms and God decides which way you turn, not you. We talk about violating our due process rights with, with whether you can get a gun or not, just all these violations. Governor Abbott has said, as for me and my state, we've had enough and we've had all we want and we're going to set this down in front of the state legislature and I'm telling you, I want it passed, and we're going to be at the Convention of States, and we're going to right this wrong right now. And all of Texas applauded. All of Texas cheered. All of Texas said, finally, an elected politician who will stand up and push back against this tyrant in the White House. We thought we could do it with our, with our elected representatives. We thought we could do it with our senators, and some did. Ted Cruz did. Some congressmen did, but not enough. And so what did Texas say? We're coming with our full force and we're coming at you and we're going to come at you legally. We're going to come at you in a democratic way. And we have got some demands. Now, folks, I want you to hear me. If you are a member of Black Lives Matter or if you're a member of these crazy rednecks and I'm from Texas, I can say redneck. These crazy rednecks out in Oregon. I want you to hear me. 
This is the right way to solve a problem. Tearing things up and protesting and flipping cars and intimidating police officers and and law-abiding citizens and, and taking over government buildings and wielding guns, that is not the right way to do it. Through the democratic process, through the outs that the founding fathers gave us, that is the right way to do it. And what we're here to do today is to educate you on this process. And on the other side of the break, and I'm not ready to go to break yet, but on the other side of the break, we have Mark Meckler, the founder of the Conventions of State Organization. He is going to get on and tell us what they are doing, why they are doing it, and how we can get involved. Because I want there to be zero excuses for listeners of this show to go out and act like a damn fool on the streets in a protest and every reason for you to get involved in the right way to solve problems. And I'm telling you unequivocally, I am now endorsing, just as I did last week, the Convention of States uh, program. We need to get with it and we need to make it happen. Now, part of this is that the states have to bring language to the table to discuss. And so, Governor Abbott proposed nine uh, amendments to the Constitution, and when you read them, they make perfect sense. The first amendment he suggests is prohibit Congress from regulating activity that occurs wholly within one state. Yes, yes. If it is bound by the borders of a state, tell me what business is it of the federal government to begin with? This is the United States. Of America. It wasn't just called America. States are sovereign. They have their right and they have agreed to be governed by a central government in certain circumstances, in certain situations. But if something is contained within the entirety of a state, then it is none of the federal government's business. Proposed Amendment 2 require Congress to balance its budget. Does anything scream more common sense than that? I have to do it. You have to do it. We have to balance our budget. If we run at a deficit, we're living on the streets. Our cars get repossessed. We don't get to run at a deficit. Why does the federal government? Because they're the ones that print the money? No. I will tell you this. The state of Texas, balanced budget is in the constitution of the state. The state legislature is not allowed to leave its session until that budget is balanced every time, all the time. And by doing so, Texas has what they call a rainy day fund or a surplus that exceeds any other in this great union because it is required. One of some others I want to point out, we're not going to go through them all. Require a seven justice supermajority vote for U.S. Supreme Court decisions that invalidate a democratically enacted law. So if the Supreme Court is going to overturn law, it now takes a supermajority. Now, if they're interpreting law, simple majority works. But if they are going to overturn law, if they're going to say that violates the constitutional rights and liberties guaranteed to its citizens, it takes a supermajority. I think that's fantastic. Allow a two-thirds majority of the states to override a Supreme Court decision. Man, this is classic. This was tailored for Obamacare right here. Because as it stands, Congress is never going to allow Obamacare to be overturned. The Supreme Court has ruled Congress isn't going to act, but the states are sick of it. And there have been enough states file suit that if those states just had to vote to override this Supreme Court decision, Obamacare would be gone. And if this truly is a government for the people, by the people, where states are sovereign, then this is a brilliant amendment. Brilliant amendment. Allow a two-thirds majority of states to override a federal law or regulation. He also prohibits administrative agencies from the unelected bureaucrats from preempting state law. So if these unelected bureaucrats Make a law and it counters state law, doesn't matter. State law supersedes. Another brilliant move. This Greg Abbott's going somewhere, folks, I'm telling you. And these are brilliant ideas, and they're not all the brilliant ideas that are going to show up at this convention. This is one man and one small committee's ideas of how to make this country great. 
Could you imagine if we got 50 people who love this country in a room and said, hey, it's broken. We need to fix it. A very special guest on the phone with us today, Mark Meckler. Uh, He is the co-founder of the Convention of States Project. And as you heard in the first 15 minutes of the show, uh, I, I am left with no other option than to say Article 5 is the answer for this country. We have tried every other option and it has fallen short. And I believe that that if we care about this country and we want to get back to what is making it great, that that we must grab a hold of this runaway government and put it back in check the way the framers of the Constitution intended to begin with. Now, Mark, first off, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you so much for taking the time to to be with us today. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be with you. Now, this this convention of states idea, it's obviously nothing new. It, it was something written into the Constitution uh, by the framers of the Constitution, by our forefathers, for a reason. Would would you help educate the audience and me, for that matter, as what was the motivation? Why Why would they put such a thing into the Constitution? You know, to me, it's one of the most incredible stories in American history and, and relatively untold, and that is that. On September 15th of 1787, two days before the end of convention, these guys are getting ready to go home. You know, they're pretty much wrapped up. They've been there on through this sweltering summer. And Colonel George Mason from Virginia notices something he believes what that is a fatal flaw in the Constitution they've drafted. And he rises to address the assembly and says something like this. He says, we have a fatal flaw in that we've given the federal government the power to propose amendment through Congress should they deem it necessary. But we haven't given that power to the states and the people acting through the states. And are we really so naive that we believe that a federal government that becomes a tyranny will propose amendments to restrain its own tyranny? God picture the, the founders, the framers slapping themselves in the foreheads and laughing. And of course, the federal government's never going to restrain its own tyranny. That's ridiculous. No centralized government ever restrains itself. And so without any debate, Madison's notes reflect no debate, which is in and of itself is extraordinary. They adopt the second clause of Article 5, which gives us the people acting through our state legislatures the power to call a convention specifically for the purpose of restraining the federal government. I think that's an extraordinary American history story. Absolutely. Now, what is th- this convention of states? You, you hear the misnomer nomer, constitutional convention. That's not what this is, correct, Mark? This this is something completely different from a constitutional convention. This is a convention of states. So if if this if the states elect to enact a, a convention of states, tell me what that does and, and how they make that happen. Sure. Well, first of all, the mechanism is thirty four states pass in their state legislatures what's called a joint resolution. That resolution is an application calling for a convention of states. And in our case, the Convention of States Project at conventionofstates.com. It's calling for a convention of states for three specific subject matter areas. Number one, to discuss proposing amendments which would impose fiscal restraints on the federal government. For example, a balanced budget amendment or making the federal government comply with generally accepted accounting principles so we get real numbers from them. Those are the kinds of fiscal restraints we can impose or anything else your imagination can fly away with on, on the fiscal side. The second is imposing scope and jurisdiction restraints On the federal government, you know, the federal government was supposed to operate in in a a narrow set of enumerated powers. They've grown way beyond that. We need to restrain them once again. We can talk about how to restrain the federal government. And the third way is to talk about imposing term limits on Congress and potentially on the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary. We've tried to impose term limits on Congress through initiative or proposition. We got it done in 23 states, and then the Supreme Court told us we're not allowed to do that. We can do it, and we can do it through Article 5. So that's the proper mechanism. That's the how things work to get into convention and what can be discussed. Okay. So my understanding is that, that this convention wouldn't just enact laws. It would actually amend or change the Constitution, add an amendment so that it would take another convention to supersede the changes made. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, let me, let me provide a little bit of nuance because that's not entirely correct. What I want you to think of the convention itself as is a meeting where the states get together and decide on what suggestions they're going to make to the states to fix the things that are wrong with the country. So the convention itself can't amend anything. They can only propose. Some people call it a proposing convention. And so they get into convention, they have debates. If if the majority of states can agree on a slate of proposed amendments, then those amendments will be delivered to the states for the debate on whether they should be ratified or not. 
Okay. And then the ratification process is a separate process in and of itself. And the threshold is, is a little bit higher, correct? That's correct. It requires three quarters of states or 38 states to ratify any given amendment. If a slate of five amendments is put out to the states, they vote on them one by one and they can approve one or all five or none of them. But yeah, it's going to take a full new investigation, new discussion, new debate. And it's going to take 38 states to ratify anything before it becomes part of the Constitution. Okay. Now, if... I'm left with no choice but to say this is the right way. And we kind of talked off the air about some of the arguments that, that you may pose to to let people know that this is the answer. And one of them I, I grab on too tightly. When when you have individuals like Michael Ferris, like Mark Levin, like Senator Coburn involved, the, these are brilliant patriots, and they are endorsing this fully. And in my situation, I have to yield to those smarter than me. I have no choice. And and you kind of lined out kind of three arguments, three points that, that you would communicate to the common man. Would you mind go ahead and, and argue those points to our audience very briefly? Because I, I think they're worth listening to, Mark. Sure. So, look, I'm just a grassroots guy. I don't claim to be the world's greatest expert on anything. I'm a lawyer. I understand Article 5 because I spent some couple of years with it now. But when I don't really – know a subject matter inside and out. I, I look to the people that I respect, the people that I listen to often about political matters, and I try to determine what their opinion is on something. And, and if there are people on both sides of the issue, kind of do a count, you know, of how many people I respect are on one side versus the other. And when you look at the Article 5 issue and you look at the people who support Article 5 right now, say it's time to call a convention of states. Obviously, I started at the top of the list with Mark Levin. He wrote the book Liberty Amendments. I have a lot of respect for Mark, constitutional lawyer, straight out of the Reagan administration, Justice Department Chief of Staff under Ed Meese, and, and obviously he's in support of using Article 5 right now. He doesn't believe it's dangerous or scary or can run away. He believes it's the only thing that can save the nation. So you got Mark Levin, Rush Limbaugh's in support of using Article 5. Sean Hannity's endorsed our project. Glenn Beck has endorsed our project. Sarah Palin, Colonel Allen West, uh, Governor Mike Huckabee, Governor John Kasich, if you want to look towards the establishment, some people, you know, come from that. Uh, Senator Marco Rubio, a leading presidential contender, just endorsed. Uh, Governor Bobby Jindal has endorsed. The list goes on. And if you want to look at the scholarly work, you've got Professor Robbie George, who I would argue is probably the greatest conservative legal scholar in America right now at Princeton. You've got Professor Randy Barnett, a libertarian legal scholar, runs the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. Uh, you got Chuck Cooper, who is the outside litigator for the NRA, says this is the best way to protect the Second Amendment. So I look at all those people on that list. Most of them, most of your listeners will know. And I say, man, if all those people are in favor, if I'm not, what am I missing? I mean, are they just all stupid? They don't get it. It doesn't make sense. And then, But I also look at the opponents because there are notable opponents. Uh, at the top of the list of the opponents, I would say there's Phyllis Schlafly, founder and, and the icon of Eagle Forum, a, a conservative icon in her own right for 50 years in America. She's definitely an opponent of using this process. And then other national figures that your listeners would know, people, names that are sort of household names in the conservative movement, right under Phyllis, I would put, um, I, well, there is nobody else. <laughs> I mean, that's just a fact. Yeah. I love Phyllis, right? But everybody's entitled to be wrong once in her career, and she's wrong on this one. There's nobody else nationally that you would know that backs her play that is opposed to this. So number one, Who's in support? Who's against? All these great people in support, virtually nobody against. Number two, I, I look at the math, and it's not complicated math. I was a law, I'm a lawyer and not a math major. I'm not great at math, but I do know this. It takes 38 states to ratify any amendment, and that means if you flip the math on its head, it's only 13 states fail to ratify, and it doesn't become part of the Constitution. So if you believe this thing can run away, and I think that's a specious argument, but if you believe it can run away, if you believe they're going to propose some kind of crazy amendment, leftist amendment, does away with our right to bear arms, limits our religious freedom, you know, deals with social issues in a way that scares us, if you believe that can happen, well, then you, you have to believe that the 13 most conservative states in America are going to vote to take away your guns. They're going to vote to take away your religious freedom. You have to believe that. you got to believe that Texas and Alabama and Mississippi and South Dakota and North Dakota, the Carolinas, Tennessee, Kentucky, you got to believe that all these states are going to vote to take away your guns. And I'm going to just be frank, that's insane. I, mean, I agree. I've been 34 states this year. Those states are staunch conservative states. We have 31 states now with both houses controlled by Republican legislatures. It is literally mathematically impossible for something crazy to come out of this convention and become part of the Constitution. 
That, that's that's reassuring because really Mark, that that was the first concern that jumped into my mind when when this idea was presented to me. Well, okay, but what if the liberals get control? What what if they they enact? But the fact that the states have to ratify and that and you've brought light to that argument. It makes me rest a lot easier knowing that at least 13 conservative states out there will hold their ground. The numbers just don't argue differently. And, and it, it's so reassuring. Well, and so let me let me close with this. And this is really important to me. If you're opposed to this, if you're worried about this, if you're fearful about this, then what's your alternative? I mean, are you relying on Congress? <laughs> How's that working out <laughs> yeah. for you? Yeah. Are we going to elect good people? We've been trying to do that for 50 years. How's that working out for you? Is it the president? Do you really believe a president is going to take power away from D.C. and give it back to you, the people? Or, or maybe you think it's the Supreme Court. Well, how'd that work for you this last year, right? And so the answer is I don't know of anything else that can save the republic. Every republic in the history of the world has crashed and burned for the same reasons. Every one. We have a chance to cheat history and thank God, and I do mean thank God, that the founders relied on God, were divinely inspired, and had the wisdom to give us this tool. And I would say it is a moral outrage and shame on us if we don't use it. We have a moral obligation both to our forefathers and to posterity to use the tool the founders gave us to save this nation from the fate of all other republics. Absolutely. Now, Mark, one last question, and then uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. But with the Convention of States organization, is is are there specific items that y'all would like to see pushed through, or is it just the idea that the, the government's out of control? We have no opposition party. We have a lawless Supreme Court and a lawless president, and it's just time for the people to take their country back. Or are there individual issues that that your organization would like to see push through. So the application contains those three subject matter areas. I talked about fiscal restraints on the federal government, scope and jurisdictional restraints on the federal government and term limits for the federal government. So those are the areas I'm not promoting any specific amendments. I got to tell you this last week, uh, Governor Abbott right there in Texas stepped up big time, came out and endorsed convention of states at Texas public policies foundation's annual policy summit. And he came up with what he calls the Texas plan, which can, it is comprised of specific amendments, nine specific amendments. It's really amazing that Abbott did this. Whatever you think of Greg Abbott, I, you know, I don't know your opinion or your listener's opinion, but he, he knows the law. He's a former Supreme Court justice there in Texas, former attorney general there in Texas. He spent his time doing this, and he made a clarion call. If you haven't seen his speech, I recommend you watch it, to retake America from the states. And he laid out nine amendments. A lot of them were I thought really fascinating and interesting and interestingly he called it the Texas plan. If you recall the original convention, Virginia came with the Virginia plan. So I don't think that's a coincidence. That's the parallel he's trying to draw. Texas is in, he's all in supporting the convention. I believe your Lieutenant governor is going to be in support. We got it done in the house last year. We're going to get it done in your Senate as well in the next session. So I think if you want to know specific amendments, don't look to convention of States, look to Mark Levin's Liberty amendments, Look into the Texas plan that the Texas governor just laid out for y'all. There are a lot of great ideas out there that fall within these three subject matter areas. Perfect. Perfect. Mark, thank you so much. Could you very briefly let our listeners know, one, where they can get some more information and two, how they can get involved? This is really important. Look, you and me, we can talk about it, but we can't save the nation. We all have to do it together. It's a citizen movement from the bottom up in Texas right now. Uh, we have about 57,000 volunteers on the ground in Texas, biggest force in the country, as you would expect from Texans. Really proud of you guys. The way you get involved is you go to conventionofstates.com, sign up. We still need district captains there in state legislative districts. Get involved, sign the petition, call your state legislator, let them know you want them to be in support. If you have friends and family around the country that don't know about it, send them to conventionofstates.com, get them educated, get them involved, make them part of the army that takes back America. Outstanding. Mark Meckler, ladies and gentlemen, co-founder of the Convention of States Project. Uh, again, you can find him at conventionofstates.com. Mark, thank you so much for your time, sir. Do not be a stranger, and I look forward to shaking your hand soon. Looking forward to it, Gavin. Thanks for being out there on the air, spreading the word. Folks, on the other side, we're going to talk about the State of the Union from last night. Don't miss it. I am Gavin Mitchell. This is the Gavin Mitchell Show. We'll see you on the other side. 
Today's episode of The Gavin Mitchell Show is brought to you by Pinnacle Voice Studios and Sound Productions. Find us on the web at PinnacleVoice.com. We'll be back in a moment. Hey, everybody, it's Chris Alcedo from the Blaze Radio Network. You are listening to The Gavin Mitchell Show. And welcome back to The Gavin Mitchell Show, ladies and gentlemen. Before we get into the State of the Union Address, I want to remind you, you can find us on the web, www.thegavinmitchellshow.com. Email me directly, gavin at thegavinmitchellshow.com. We are on Twitter at the GM Show, Facebook, facebook.com forward slash the Gavin Mitchell Show. And we are on a number of internet radio stations. And it seems that uh, where, where our show is housed is growing daily. So thank you to all those guys. Please log on to the website, find out where we're at and the times we're running. Tune in, listen. You never know. You might find another great conservative talk show host out there that you enjoy and, and can tune into them as well. Uh, you can subscribe to us via iTunes. We're on Spreaker. Tune in uh, again. But all that information can be found on the website. So the State of the Union address happened last night, and there was a lot of talk leading up to it. A lot of talk. In fact, most conservative talk show hosts that I listen to religiously weren't going to listen. They weren't going to tune in. They were confident that it was going to be the same old rhetoric, the same old garbage, the same old smoke and mirrors from the con artist in chief. And they just weren't interested. In fact, Chris Salcedo here in the Dallas area decided he he was probably going to play a drinking game, grab his favorite adult beverage. And every time the president referred to himself in the first person, he was going to to have a drink. And he was willing to bet that he wasn't going to be able to walk by the time this speech was over. Uh, he kind of took a humorous approach, kind of a, a tongue in cheek. However, Mark Levin, a uh, a very conservative, a very popular talk show host, took an opposite approach. In fact, he's furious. He is furious. He, he's such a patriot. And if you listen to him, you, you cannot deny that he loves this country. But he refused to listen. And and the reason being isn't because he doesn't respect the office. It's because he doesn't respect the man. He He's had it with the lies and the agendas and the ruining the country. And he, he's just had enough. And, and Levin has even said he's been invited to several of these State of the Union addresses. And he, he's not even going to watch this one, much less attend, which, which I find fascinating because – even when great patriots disagree, they still love the country enough to show respect for the office, to show respect for our culture and for our traditions. And for someone like Levin to cash in his chips before it even happens, it just shows the frustration and the disdain for, for the direction this president has taken us and taken this country. And, and people are sick of it. And, and the countdown clock has begun. And so the the state of, of illusion uh, address last night as as I'm going to affectionately call it there there was a lot of extracurricular going on there were a lot of stories on the periphery one Ted Cruz wasn't going to be there not interested he's got campaigning to do he needs to win the presidency he wasn't going to be there I wonder as the breakdown happens as as more people get their hands on it is this going to be like Rubio not showing up for the omnibus bill or is this going to be forgivable? I, I think it's going to be fascinating. For me personally, I don't care if Ted Cruz is at the State of the Union address. I don't care. There, There is no obligation. It's tradition. It does. Is it a little faux pas? Yeah, it is. It's a little faux pas. Because uh, the camera panned to Marco Rubio several times, Bernie Sanders. I mean, the other candidates for president were there. But but Ted Cruz wasn't. And so faux pas, yes, is it the if it's the worst thing Ted Cruz does, he's a okay. So Ted Cruz wasn't there. The other things that are that are kind of laying in the weeds. The empty chair next to the first lady, Michelle Obama, it is supposed to represent the empty chair for all of the victims of gun violence over a recent period. It's so ridiculous. I can't even remember exactly what it's for. But it's for the fallen victims of gun violence over the past X amount of years. What a crock this is. This is a play equal 
to Barack Obama running the parents of Sandy Hook out onto the stage and shedding these alligator tears as he shoves executive order down our throat. That is what this is equivalent to. And I saw a great tweet last night, and I retweeted it immediately. You know what? Let's let that be the the fallen victim in San Francisco to the illegal immigrant, because that's a sanctuary city. Let's let the chair represent that. I heard another great comment on the radio. Let's let that chair be all the hundreds of thousands of babies that Planned Parenthood has murdered. Let's let the chair represent that instead of blaming an object for people dying instead of the people that pull the trigger. It is it is incredible to me how this president thinks he's able to spin these things into whatever he wants them to be, and, and it's disgusting. Another great point that uh, many people are making is the Syrian refugee that's present. And last night, if you watched, the camera panned over to him, and this guy's falling asleep during this State of the Union address. He doesn't want to be there. He is a symbolic token for the con artist in chief to say, hey, wear it right on your chin. Not only am I leaving a seat open for gun violence victims and I'm taking your guns away by executive order, I'm I'm bringing Syrian refugees in, whether you like it or not, and I'm going to display both of them front and center at the State of the Union address with the whole world watching and shoving it right down your throat, and there's not a thing you can do about it, citizens of the United States. So we've talked a little bit about the the periphery, what's going on around the actual speech itself, and, and there are so many people out there in this world disinterested in what the president actually had to say, and, and I think there's reason for that. I don't think They think he's a lame duck president. He's on his way out. This is just pomp and circumstance. I don't think that's it at all. I think what it is, is that people truly and genuinely do not believe the things this president has to say. I think they, they believe wholeheartedly. He's disingenuous. I believe they, they believe there's always an ulterior motive. And quite frankly, they've had enough. They've had enough. So we talked about the the periphery. We've talked about everything that's going on around the speech. Let's get into the speech itself. And there's a very important note we need to remember while this speech is going on. While this is happening, Iran has captured United States Navy sailors, and they have them in custody. Two Marine boats were, were taken captive of earlier yesterday, and they have in custody those boats and the sailors on it. Now, this is the same country that houses terrorists. This is the same country that Barack Obama swears can be an ally if we can just turn them a little bit. And so he has brokered a deal, not a treaty, very important, because a treaty would need congressional approval. So once again, to skate congressional oversight, it's a deal. And this deal not only allows Iran to self-police themselves for nuclear weapons, which we all know that's going to happen on the up and up. It funds them with an incredible amount of money. And this country has already broken the deal by, by testing ballistic missiles. They fired a missile within 1,500 yards of a United States warship. And now they have captured two boats with, with a roughly 10 to 20 sailors. I've seen different reports. And this president is sitting at the State of the Union cracking jokes. Are you kidding me? And we haven't even gotten into the issues yet, ladies and gentlemen. That's just what's sitting on the surface. He refuses to acknowledge any realities. And that's the part that that cracks me up is because during this entire speech, it was laced with with facts that were sugar-coated or were twisted a little bit or just flat-out lies. But yet, just earlier this week, he goes on CNN, or or late last week, goes on CNN and talks about, I want to talk with the NRA, but we need to talk truth and facts, not this fairy tale stuff they bring to the table. 
What do you call that State of the Union address then, Barack Obama? Because it seems sprinkled in fairy dust and lies and all kinds of other garbage. May history judge you accordingly, sir. So some of the things that stuck out at me, one is that he he really wants to push for the young minds of this country to get educated in, in computer technology, in IT, whether it's coding or hardware. He really wants to push for this. What I don't understand is why. Why? Because if you read Mark Levin's book, Plunder and Deceit, you learn quickly that those in the STEM fields that, that have college degrees in the STEM fields, and I know we've talked about this previously, but over 70% of them do not have occupations in the field that they earn their degree. They're all going to foreign workers. And those foreign workers are driving the wages down and they have plateaued since the early 90s. There, there hasn't been any increase, but yet he wants to fund our young people getting educated in those fields. And why, if he's going to keep issuing these work visas? And then he comes right out later on in the speech and looks us in the eye and says, these immigrants are not keeping the wages down. Absolute garbage. That is a lie through and through. It is an absolute lie, and I don't understand it. I don't understand how he can get away with this. It makes no sense whatsoever. He also made some comments, and, and you can catch a lot of commentary all over the place about this, but there are just some things that, that I know for a fact that I want to bring to the table. People on food stamps didn't cause the financial crisis. That is not true. But, but let me unpack that. His accusation was Wall Street and the rich and the corrupt broke laws. To, that, that's not true. The Clinton administration had a goal and set out on this mission, this endeavor, so that all people could live the American dream and could own a house. And so HUD came through and through some strong arming of these lending banks, they made it so that everyone would be able to purchase a house. This was the invention of the ninja loan. No income, no job, no assets. It's stated income, all of that garbage that would allow you to get a mortgage when you didn't qualify. All these, all these people that made X amount of dollars when you needed Y to purchase the house, they could just write in Y and not have to prove it. Well, turn the page, a lot of those were adjustable rate mortgages because they had to lever the the interest rate down so they could afford it. Well, three, five, seven years later, that rate goes up. They can't afford it. They're the foreclosures. All these mortgages have been bundled together and securitized, and all of those assets flopped. That's why we had the crisis. And, and I'm not going to accept any other answer because this is actually some of my research. This is in my field in my wheelhouse. So all of this just complete garbage, and we're running out of time. And, and folks, I hope last night underscores the importance to get educated, to go out and vote a conservative in. On the other side, I want to talk about El Chapo and the Mexican government and the drug cartels. And they're getting ready to extradite him, at least they're trying to. But Ethan Couch is still in Mexico. Leave you scratching your head a little bit. Let's talk about the kingpin on the other side. This is the Gavin Mitchell Show. I am Gavin Mitchell. The Gavin Mitchell Show, the podcast, is brought to you by Pinnacle Voice Studios and Sound Productions. Find us on the web at PinnacleVoice.com. We'll be back in a moment. So Joaquin El Chapo Guzman Lorea. He is the drug kingpin in Mexico who has now effectively broken out of prison twice. You, you heard me correct. He has escaped prison twice, and he was on the run until just recently. I don't know if you paid attention, but the, the Mexican officials now have him in custody, and he has been returned to the very prison that he broke out of last I don't know if it's the same cell, but I just find that incredibly ironic. So this man has has been in charge of one of the major drug cartels in in the world. And he has made comments publicly that if you have seen or used heroin, cocaine, marijuana, 
There is about a 95% chance in the United States that that is his product he has shipped over. And, and that is outrageous. And the statistics support it. This guy is a drug kingpin. He is an incredibly savvy businessman, incredibly intelligent businessman. It's just unfortunate he applied it to an illegal and dangerous trade. I, could you imagine if we had someone like him running a legitimate business? My gosh, it would flourish. It would be incredible. But I don't think it's possible because Mr. Uh, El Chapo's uh, business intellect isn't the only attribute he carries. He's a very dangerous man. Uh, he has been credited with the deaths of up to 125,000 people in Mexico. That includes other cartels, foot soldiers. It includes government officials, judges, police officers, military, you name it. If you get in El Chapo's way, it's TKO for you as far as he is concerned. He has no problem getting rid of any problem that crosses his path. In fact, one of the things I saw on the news as he was bring, being brought into custody on the blaze is that he was responsible for 11 deaths of a rival cartel, and he took these 11 foot soldiers for the rival cartel, decapitated them, and shipped the bodies to what would be the capital town of this cartel and dropped them off right there in the middle of the street. 11 decapitated carcasses to send a message. That's the kind of guy this guy is, right? Incredibly dangerous. But the Mexican officials can't seem to, to get a hold of him. He was arrested and escaped in 2001 while serving a 20-year prison sentence in Mexico. He was on the run until February 14th, where he was arrested again put into the penitentiary, and escaped July 2015. And that's the one we all know about. That's the one where he dug the elaborate tunnel with all the help he had uh, and escaped. And they're trying to figure out, well, was he aided or not? Well, you don't dig a mile-long tunnel without some help, right? And you don't get to just leave a, a cell without the guards knowing. But he did. And, and he escaped, and he's been on the run since. This guy, just to, to unpack more of who he is, is he made his wife, which happened to be the daughter of another drug cartel head, made his wife go to California to give birth to his daughters so that they could be anchor babies, so they could be U.S. citizens. And with that, th there's a lot more that goes on with that other than them just becoming anchor baby United States citizens. Ted Kennedy's Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 allows these daughters, because they are U.S. citizens, to apply for an unlimited amount of exceptions to bring family members over to the United States. Let's unpack this. So you and I are brothers, and you're an anchor baby. You were born in the United States, and you have full rights of a U.S. citizen. I am not. I was born in Mexico. I am a Mexican citizen. I, I have to go through the visa process and, and whatever else may may occur with that. So if I want to come over and you agree to do it, you can apply for a sponsorship of some sort. You, you can apply and, and give this petition to where I can come over and live with you and all's kosher. It's an automatic visa. And these daughters get an unlimited number of those. Now, you can't tell me that El Chapo and his cronies are not smart enough to forge Mexican birth certificates or whatever else is necessary to put his infrastructure in place in America now that they have a gateway. You can't tell me he's not. How dangerous is this? And it is shocking to me that once again, the liberals, the left are out there. And this happened in 1965. Their ways haven't changed one bit compromising the safety of America and the United States citizens by letting just whoever they want walk through that door, including cartel leaders and their families, including a guy who was chopped up 11 individuals and sent them back to, to their homeland to send a message. That's this guy. And he made sure he jumped right through that loophole by making his wife go to California and have their kids. At what point do we wake up and realize this door has to be shut? 
We are compromising everything we are and our safety, our kids' safety, for what? Because we want to be politically correct? I don't understand it. And so this El Chapo has been placed in the same prison that he was let out of, or I say let out, escaped, whichever word. There's semantics at this point, isn't it? And that's where he's staying. And the U.S. government, when he was first captured, said, we want him extradited here. We've got charges to bring against him. We want him extradited here. There, there's no way that he is, is, is safe there. There's no way he's not going to escape. And the Mexican officials are like, it's impossible for him to escape twice. Just can't happen. Well, bada bing, bada boom, El Chapo's on the streets again. He escaped again. And so now there is a firm push from the U.S. government, from, from the DEA and all the powers that be. They want El Chapo in the United States locked up here so he can't get away. Obviously, the statistics say that his chance of escaping here in the United States is much less than if it were in Mexico, and they're pushing hard. The Mexican officials have come out and said, yeah, not a problem. We're all for that. We're going to get this done. We're going to push that through. The problem is El Chapo's got money. He's got more than a little bit of money. And if El Chapo's people come to you, a Mexican official, and says, hey, no extradition, here's you a couple hundred thousand dollars, and you decide not to take that deal, you end up with those other fellas with no head laying in the street to send a message. That is Mexico. That's how it works. It is shady and it's corrupt, and I'm sure the left is going to spin it as, no, they're, they're great people, they're going to do the right thing. I'm telling you right now, sitting here, even though the United States government and the Mexican government said this extradition is going to happen, I'm telling you it's a 50-50 shot at best. I, I just don't see it happening. If it were so easy to extradite somebody from Mexico, if it were so automatic, if money and prestige didn't play a role in it, then why is Ethan Couch sitting in some refugee camp or something alike in Mexico City? Why isn't he sitting in the Tarrant County Jail on the male floor, why his mom's on the female floor here in Fort Worth, Texas, waiting his trial. Why is he in Mexico? If this is so automatic and it's so easy and they're so straightforward, why is Ethan Couch still in Mexico City? The answer is because it's not. It's not straightforward. It's not that easy. Money plays a factor in this if you're in Mexico, right? And El Chapo is one of the richest SOBs in the Western Hemisphere. He's renowned. He's he's loved for some reason. Now, how does Sean Penn find the most wanted man in the world and sit down to an interview with him? And El Chapo's all about it. I mean, this little sawed off guy, by the way, El Chapo means the shorty, right? The short guy. This guy has killed not through drug use and abuse, but just flat out murdered almost 125,000 people in Mexico countless others through his drug distribution, ruined families and lives, and Sean Penn sees him as a celebrity. Is that not the problem in Hollywood today? Their compass is all jacked up. We're all about, if you listen, this Jennifer Lawrence, this, this Hunger Games bow and arrow cat, she's praising Planned Parenthood because without it, she would have got pregnant as a kid because she couldn't close her legs she grew up in a Jesus house, right? But she comes out and says, if it wasn't for Planned Parenthood, I would have a kid now. What's what's so wrong with having children to begin with, right? Mistakes happen, you own up to it. But what she's alluding to is, had I got pregnant, had I not been able to get the, the birth control pills and the condoms from Planned Parenthood, had that not happened, then I would have got pregnant and I would have had an abortion. That's what she was alluding to. And shame on her. And it all goes back to this moral compass that the left just lacks. They lack common sense and rationale. And then Sean Penn goes down there to interview El Chapo, one of the most wanted men in the in the world. He ends up getting him caught. And so it turned out to be the lust for fame and the lust for notoriety that ended up getting our little short friend El Chapo arrested. And my hope is that, yes, he does come back to the United States and he faces a very severe sentences because each of those 125,000 people he killed have families. And it is time for us to draw a line. It has got to stop and it's got to stop now. 
And I, I, it seems that I close out every show with it has to stop. But at some point, we're going to wake up, folks. In the words of the great Ray Wiley Hubbard, on the days that I keep my gratitude higher than my expectations, well, I have really good days. Folks, I hope you all have a great day. Uh, I want to remind you that changes are coming to the Gavin Mitchell show. If you happen to own a business or know somebody that does that would like to get the word out through our show, we are now accepting advertisers. So get a hold of us. Sales at the Gavin Mitchell show dot com. Love to talk to you. Great rates. And, and we would love to spread the word about great companies. So get a hold of us. Uh, until next time, I am Gavin Mitchell. This has been the Gavin Mitchell show. Thanks for listening to The Gavin Mitchell Show, the voice of the working man, produced in Fort Worth, Texas. If you like what you just heard, subscribe on iTunes at Spreaker.com. These and other links can be found on our website at thegavinmitchellshow.com. Be sure to tell your friends and colleagues about the voice of the working man's daily podcast. All opinions expressed by the host or guests on this series are solely their opinions and do not reflect the views, policies, or positions of The Gavin Mitchell Show or its affiliates. This has been a Ron Phillips Pinnacle Voice Studios production. Thank you.